This is the Untamed Ethos Podcast. Join us as investment pros, executives, and other experts talk business, personal growth, investing, politics, and the trending topics well-rounded pros need to know about. Authentic, unfiltered, and fun. Joshua Wilson is the founder of United Ethos Wealth Partners, a registered investment advisor. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of United Ethos's investment advice on this podcast, and nothing you'll hear on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. All opinions expressed by Joshua and by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of United Ethos or its affiliates. Welcome back to Untamed Ethos. I'm Joshua Wilson, and I have uh, with me a guest I've been looking forward to for quite some time, uh, Dr. Corey Clark. Uh, from the, uh, she's currently a visiting professor at a uh, visiting scholar at University of Pennsylvania, where she's also the executive director of the I believe it's the Adversarial Collaboration Project. You're going to tell me tell us a bit more about what that is. Um, and got, she got, received her PhD in social and personality psychology from UC Irvine. And I think one of the, the reasons I've been so um, excited to have you on, Dr. Clark, is you have jumped into so many hornet's nests um, with the subjects that you've been willing to discuss. I mean, it's uh, everything from censorship to victimhood status and manipulation and bias in academia and online culture, uh, very sensitive topics. You've talked about the differences in males and females and how those things are perceived. And um, you've talked about uh, diversity and how diversity has wonderful things in certain contexts, but may have some drawbacks in others. Uh, you've just talked about a lot of things that there is really only accepted one conclusion and it's got to be binary and it's got to be black and white and you've shown a light on some things and said hey there's a lot of topics that there's truth here and there's truth here and maybe it's not as simple as as it seems and you've also shown some lights on the ways in which that academia can really prevent some of the pure truth of some of these topics from from being accepted or even even talked about, almost silenced folks. So um, first question I have for you, Dr. Clark, <laughs> is how in the world have you not been canceled yet? <laughs> I've been, I've been, I, I say I've been canceled light, you know, like a lot of people don't like me and I'm not welcome probably in some places, especially among social psychologists. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, canceled light for now and probably eventually fully canceled is coming at some point. Um, but yeah, it's fun. Um, I have a lot of allies and a lot of people, you know, you get both positive and negative feedback. So a lot of people hate me. That's true. But a lot of people, you know, you know, I get a lot of emails from colleagues, even in social psychology, who are very scared of their peers and the environment there who will like thank me for what I'm doing and say they admire my work. And I'm like, you say something too, but, <laughs> but it's fine. Say it out loud. Not just don't want to email. Yeah, exactly. uh, this I, message I, will self-destruct have... in 30 seconds. Well, <laughs> not, not, not like say to me like that you're, you know, on my side or whatever, but just, you know, speak out more about what you think is right and wrong and, you know, what is the proper direction of science and should we be concerned about how many people are self-censoring and, how much censorship is actually creeping into the scientific uh, decision-making process. Just like talk about that, but um, it is very reputationally costly. And so I understand, you know, people who are tenured or people who are on tenure track are afraid of not getting tenure if they jump into these um, issues. And then people who have tenure, I've actually found in one of my papers that's currently under review, people who have tenure are no less afraid of getting fired for talking about these kinds of controversial topics than people who are untenured. Um, but on top of that, if anything, tenured people are even a little bit more scared of the social uh, consequences of getting ostracized by their peers of being called names on Twitter and things like that. And I think the reason um, they're a little bit more afraid is because professors who have tenure are so invested in this one career path. They've put all of their time and all of their energy into this particular expertise. And if they can't survive here, 
they've got nowhere else to go or they'd have to radically change the direction in their lives. So like once they've, you know, committed that this is going to be my career, this is my legacy, this is what I'm going to do with my life, they're even less inclined to want to speak up about these kinds of things. So as opposed to like offering the protection for people to speak up and study the topics they want once they have tenure, I see that that potentially doesn't really happen. And and if anything, ten, once people are tenured, they're even less likely to dive into controversy. So uh, yeah, my career is always in a precarious position. And, you know, if I, if I officially uh, find myself uh, jobless in academia, so be it, I'll figure something else out. Well, I, I think you have a variety of, <laughs> of skills and, and you're an interesting person to hear from. So, but, but I think that the, the biggest thing that's, that's shocking is, you know, you're, you're still, uh, you're still young in academia, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I call myself an ECR, but I think I probably I might've crossed that bridge. We're, I think we're, we're in the same boat here as the el- elder millennials, <laughs> uh, barely, barely millennials, um, millennials track. Mm-hmm. So, well, for, the, for those of my listeners who are unfamiliar with some of your work, maybe give me an overview of a few of the topics that, that you have talked about publicly that have created this, uh, this backlash against you or, <laughs> or the outsider status in, in some type of regard. Just give, give us kind of an overview of a few of the things you talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, when I first... I, my, my sort of first area of research was looking at motivated free will belief. That wasn't controversial at all. It was essentially like people, when they want to punish other people, they attribute more free will to, to them and they um, believe more that humans have free will. Uh, that that was, people loved that. <laughs> like it wasn't controversial. People liked me for that research. Um, it wasn't until I started getting in a little bit into political bias that I think people started to become a little bit wary of me, um, you know, looking at political bias on both the left and right, because people in academia, they tend to lean to the left. And so they mostly want to portray conservatives as these like crazy biased people who have all these backward beliefs and view the world in the wrong way. And, um, you know, they, they have bad motives and they can't you know, they can't understand science or appreciate science or their their views are not backed by empirical reality. Um, and what I found in my work is that liberals and conservatives are both essentially biased to more or less the same degree. So people don't really like that. And then I've looked at domains of liberal bias specifically. So liberals seem to be particularly biased when it comes to issues of gender and race. Um, and so those are really the most controversial topics in the social sciences, if not maybe the world. <laughs> um, so uh, saying that liberals are particularly prone to bias in those domains um, is not something people like to hear. And then, as you've said, I've gotten into other um, controversial topics as well, including, you know, looking at what what are the controversial topics in science that we can't talk about? Um and looking at, you know, victimhood is a, is a controversial topic because you can't really question people's status as a victim if they say something bad happened to them. You have to believe them. You can't doubt them. And then also you have to morally defer to them. And we see that victimhood is associated with a lot of negative psychological um, traits and tendencies. And so that's controversial. Um, yeah. So, yeah, as you said, <laughs> I guess I kicked a lot of. You know, it's it's interesting because you know when you when you think about victimhood, you know, it gets into the psychology of you know narcissism, and you know we mm-hmm. culturally are very familiar with the idea of an overt or malignant narcissist, someone who demonstrates um, the obvious signs of narcissism, and you know the grandiose and. Um, type of behavior and then I'm better than you and you owe me things. And, you know, there is um, what a lot of people don't understand is there's actually a uh, element of a low self-esteem or you know, behind that um, and needing for that reaffirmation. But what is, I think society is less familiar with is the covert or um, vulnerable narcissist who tends to derive a lot of their status um, or um, their advantages from playing the victim. And um, and from manipulating others by uh, by essentially playing the victim, and that's not something that we hear very much about. If you if you talk about victimhood, if um, then then you get you instantly get status, and it's you can't be questioned, you can't be you can't be examined, and we even see that on college campuses um, of 
various things being accused and where it's even, um, you know, your, your words are violence or your words are hurtful. Your words make me a victim. And then you have to be canceled. You have to be removed. You are now um, a perpetrator because I'm hurt. And it's given tremendous uh, power to, to the role of, of to being a victim. And in actuality, yeah, there's, it's... go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, the, so there's, it's a fairly new lo line of research only in the past handful of years. I think people have been looking at it, but there's an individual difference trait called tendency toward interpersonal victimhood. And it is related with aspects of the dark triad. I think Machiavellianism and I th possibly narcissism. Um, but these people, the people who are high in this trait, they tend to have a lot of self-pity. They feel like everyone's against them and the world's against them and their interpersonal react or interactions. They tend to feel like other people are treating them poorly, even if maybe they're not. Um, and as a consequence of this, they feel like they're entitled to various things, like they're entitled to cheat. They're entitled to treat other people like garbage because the world has treated them so poorly. But it's it's this type of person who's just really self-pitying in a way that makes them willing to treat everyone else terribly and manipulate other people and take advantage of people to take advantage of other people to get ahead. Um, and it's, it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky sort of personality trait because you can't call these kinds of people out because that will only like affirm their belief that they are the victim and that nobody believes them and the world's against them and everything's unfair. Um, and also on top of that, people just don't want to call out people who claim to have been mistreated because then it makes you look callous. Um, so it can really create this bad interpersonal and intergroup dynamic um, when you have people feeling like the victim because they feel justified in retaliating and treating other people poorly. Then those people feel like they've been mistreated and they want to retaliate and the cycle just goes on and on. So um, it can be a really damaging thing. And, and the tricky part is like, you know, some people really have been treated terribly and some people really have had horrible things happen to them. And we want to help those people. But lumped into that same category is people who are actually just trying to manipulate everyone and get under resources. Um, and so figuring out who the real victims are and who are who's just kind of like faking victimhood to get status and resources from other people is really tricky. And then and then also figuring out uh, a question, I, I don't really have time to look at this, but I would like to look at it, um, which is why do everyday people have such a strong desire to want to help victims and defer to them and give them status and resources? Because generally, these are people who are taking more than they're giving. Um, and usually that's a socially costly thing that we shouldn't we shouldn't want to affiliate with those kinds of people because they're socially costly. But instead, we elevate them and you know, we we want to help them and depart with our own resources to benefit um, these other people. So it's a really interesting puzzle, and maybe one day I'll I'll get to study it. <laughs> it it's interesting too because you know, the, I would imagine that there's an element of whose side are you on? Because as uh, you know, some of the things you've talked about have been the differences between males and females, and you know, the differences in perception of how studies are received, whether the outcome favors males or favors females. And this is one of those things that I always think is funny is, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes from, I, I'd say in economics, but really in life is from Dr. Thomas Sowell. And he says, there, uh, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. And so anytime you give me a, um, an answer, which is, you can think of that as a solution, or this is a truth, there was a trade-off that was created to get that truth. You know, it's like saying, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm physically stronger than you, Dr. Clark. Well, I also have to consume twice as many calories as you, and I also take up twice as much space as you. And, you know, there, there's some. Other... I would love to consume twice as many calories. <laughs> that sounds nice. You know, there's you know, the trade-off is probably that you probably have more endurance than I have. You know, so you can if you want to highlight one thing, you know, well, you know, 
Dr. Clark has much more endurance than, than, than Joshua does. Uh, well, but she's probably not as physically strong, you know, and, and there's, there's always a trade-off. But when we like to highlight one thing, we don't like to discuss the trade-offs is if you are saying any one thing is true, what is also true because that is true. And, um, and so it, it's very favorable. There's certain things you can talk about that are favorable in certain groups, but we don't want to talk about the trade-off of if that is true, then what is also true. And, you know, that, that I think the physical strength is kind of one of those things is um, that, that is less controversial to talk about, if you will. I guess it is now, now that now that we have the whole sports thing and the trans thing and shouldn't should biological men be comp competing with, uh, with biological women. So I guess that actually is uh, becoming controversial now. But, um, you know, the the presumption would be is you're 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 going against what's what's good for you, Dr. Clark, in, in some of the things you talked about. So give me about get, talk, talk to me about some of the things you've talked about or, or that you've studied when it comes to the differences between men and women and how those things are perceived in academia and and how those conclusions are treated. Yeah, I will say even even separate from the trans issue, which, of course, has made um yeah, physical differences between men and women more controversial than those were, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but even as recently as I think three, four, five years ago, I had Googled men are stronger than women because this was one of the more uncontested differences between men and women. And I think all but one of those images, I think there were like two neutral ones, but there was one that portrayed men as being stronger than women and all the rest were like images of a woman being stronger than a man. So like a woman lifting a man over her head, a woman running faster than a man, um, a woman beating a man in arm wrestling. So so even even though that's one of the most undisputed um, gender differences is specifically upper body strength, um, people still have this desire to see uh, women as better than men. Um, so yeah, I guess you asked two questions. One is what are the differences between men and women? That's of course that that could be a three hour long conversation. But the the big taboo there is that there are psychological differences between men and women um, that are related to um, one would be like academic ability. So uh, do men have a slight quantitative advantage compared to women? Do women have this slight verbal advantage compared to men? Is the distribution among men bigger, which would indicate that even if men and women, for example, when it comes to intelligence, their means are very similar. Um, some people say men are a teeny bit higher, but it's, it's a very small difference. Um, but if men have a bigger distribution, then you would expect that when we look at geniuses, like, or even super geniuses, like people in the top 0.01% of intelligence in the human population, um, they're going to be mostly men. Uh, even if women on average tend to be about as smart as men, if you look among the absolute smartest potentially you see a lot more men than you will see women. So that's controversial. Um, there, there are differences in their personalities. So men and women had different sort of evolu evolutionary challenges that caused men and women to have slightly different values. Their values, of course, overlap a lot, but they differ on average. Um, and I'm, I've written one paper um, on, it was a Colette article, actually, one article on how men and women's difference pri different priorities have um, seem to be manifesting in differential support for academic freedom. So men are more willing to pursue the truth and support academic freedom, even when it comes to controversial conclusions, whereas women are more likely to think like, no, we have to protect people from potentially dangerous scientific findings. And they're more likely to think, you know, we want to be pursuing science to help people. And if this isn't going to help people, it's not worth pursuing. So they're less supportive of free speech and academic freedom and things like that. Um, but I think differences between in men and women are probably um, responsible for a lot of trends. Like, for example, I think men value meritocracy a little bit more than women do. Women are a little bit more egalitarian. And I think that potentially explains a lot of things that are happening, for example, in um, K-12 and higher ed, which is that um, <laughs> there's a lot of grade inflation going on. The average GPA over the past 20 years is like, I think the average GPA now is like 3.8 or something insane. <laughs> Whereas back in the day, you know, average was probably like a 2.8 or maybe a 3.0. Um, 
And so universities are getting these applications. And they're like, wow, everyone has above a 4.0. Uh, but then it makes it difficult to distinguish between the more talented and the less and then talented anything students. Also getting that actually does distinguish between students is be, we're getting rid of we're getting rid of because yeah. no more ACT, yeah. SAT, GRE. Exactly. And so I think those are potentially caused by the advancement of women in institutions and positions of power. Um, OK, so that's that's some of the stuff that differs between men and women that's potentially controversial. Um, but I think what you were uh, bringing up was also I have a study and Steve Stewart Williams has conducted a handful of similar studies where when you have people evaluate scientific findings that portray men or women in a more favorable way. So men are smarter than women or men are uh, men lie more than women or uh, men are better drawers than women. Um, what you see is people evaluate male favoring science as worse science than female favoring science, even when it's the exact same thing. So women are smarter, women lie more, or sorry, whatever. Yeah, you get the, the reverse of that. Um, so, so it seems that people kind of have this bias where they want women to be better than men. Um, so they are, they evaluate information that portrays women as better than men more favorably than information that portrays men more favorably than women. Um, so even where we find these differences between men and women, if the findings go in the wrong direction, then you can get in a lot of trouble and potentially your work will be censored um, as it, it it does occasionally, especially with the greater male variability hypothesis um, and you know other psychological differences. It's it's all very controversial. Is this? I mean, is this uh, really for that reason, that I think, hypothesis yeah. though that I mean, I, I get we call it that, but obviously this has not been proven in every context. But let, let me let me unpack this um, the the variability. So, you know, two things. Number one is one thing that we do very poorly, I think, in the education system is really drive home the fact that when we say X is better than Y or X is bigger than Y or X is smaller than Y, whatever that is, that we typically mean on average. That is the default meaning of, you know, men are taller than women on average. That's what we mean is on average. And you see so many rebuttals to this and I'm not, you know, uh, that are, well, that's not my experience or that's not always true. Like you were talking about the, you know, well, you know, all these images of women being stronger than men. And I saw this, I forget what it was. It was maybe it was grip strength or some there's different ways you can do this. And, you know, the a guy that was in the, the second decile or the first it was, it was the same as an average woman or something like that, you know? Right. And so it's like, yeah, if you, uh, one woman out of 10 is going to be stronger than the average guy or something like that, you know, or, or as strong as the... it's actually really like with strength, it's really low. Like almost all men are okay. stronger than almost all, but with like psychological differences, the distributions overlap, of course, quite sure. A bit. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, that, that is something I, whenever you talk about these things, you have to like remind your, yourself to say on average, average on average, on average, because then you get the anecdote, uh, the anecdote, yeah. anecdote uh, debunking. No, that's not true. You know, that's not true. You can say something is true 99% of the time, and by, <laughs> by definition, that's going to be not true 1% of the time. Um, so the, so what, what you're talking about is not just you know, the averages, but then you're also talking about the distribution and what you're saying in that sense, um, to give people illustration is, you know, that, um, that all the best, the very, very, very best, and all the very, very, very worst tend to be men. And so you tend to see, if you're looking at a distribution, if you're familiar with statistics and you're used to seeing that normal distribution, then you would see that uh, women's distribution would be, have a higher peak right? And the, and the males would be a flatter distribution because they have more members at the absolute best and the absolute worst. And this tends to be the case in a lot of things that have been studied, whether it comes to, you know, maladaptive psychological states like sociopaths, psychopaths, you know, murderers, mass murderers, all, all the worst things tend to be dominated by men. And we love talking well, about, we're okay talking about those <laughs> things, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, those are those. It, so the greater male variability hypothesis would generally be more visible when you're looking at things that men and women are on average the same. Yeah. So like potentially with intelligence, if we put the male female mean roughly the same, then you should expect more men at the tippy top and more men at the tippy bottom, if you want to call it that. But when it comes to things like, for example, violence, um, you know, the distributions between men and women there would be not overlapping very much yeah. where almost all of the violence in the world is is uh, perpetrated by men. Women don't tend to engage in violence. They don't t they tend not to kill people. Uh, in, near at nearly the rate men at the other extreme <laughs> the overwhelming majority of uh, of defenders of violence those who prevent violence and those who yep. um, defend those who are victims or who have the potential of being victims or are under threat of being victimized are also men so when you kind of look at this distribution mm -hmm. is yes men are doing the most to battle the problem and doing the most to to, to cause the problem right so there's there's still that great variation of of, of the of it yeah, it's one of the tricky things when you talk about, like, you know, people like to talk about, is the world more fair, or unfair to men or women? And that's one thing is like, men are expected to put their lives at risk to defend women and children, but they're defending women and children from other men. So they're causing the problem, but they're also trying to stop the problem. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to make those comparisons. But there's actually... Um, I guess coming back to male and female differences, a colleague of mine, Maya Grasso is her name. She told me about some of her own work where she sees that men will step up to protect people from physical harm, whereas women will step up to protect people from like psychological or emotional harm, um, which I think is, again, related to what we see with so sort of incentivizing victimhood or incentivizing people to, uh, you know, complain about psychological safety or, you know, words are violence. Um, as women's concerns are, you know, becoming more and more important in society, we would expect that because women would incentivize that kind of behavior more because we're more concerned with protecting people's feelings. Um, whereas men are like, man, suck it up. Uh, women are like, no, actually, this was really important. We need to protect people from psychological and emotional, emotional harm. Um, so yeah, the differences between men and women, you know, depending what we're looking at sometimes they're huge sometimes they're tiny sometimes they're different just in the distributions um but i do think that because we have these average differences they probably explain a lot of changes happening in the world as you know 50 plus years ago women were pretty much excluded from power and from participating in any institutions that had a big impact on the world and now they are starting to dominate and they're like fully taking over certain institutions, academia being one. Um, and so as women gain power and are now making up the majority of leaders, uh, we should expect differences in, you know, the priorities of our institutions. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I think that that's an important point you, you bring up is at no point does this constitute a denial of reality of the past. It is understanding that culture has changed and has adapted in, in many ways for the better. And I think in, in, I think some of this is overblown to an extent in that, you know, when we, if we really go back and we're honest about how the world was 100 years ago and versus 150 years ago, and just how dramatically harder it was to just survive and how that, you know, if, if we were to go through some sort of nuclear holocaust or whatever, you, you know, whatever Armageddon, you know, the scenario into the world scenario and the civilization would level, you would probably see men and women kind of break themselves up much more like the world was 150 years ago, 200 years ago, than it is now because of the demands of the life uh, of, of just being alive and taking care of children and keeping the species going. And, you know, the, the fact that technology, technology is, it, it has, has, is what has enabled women more than anything else to, to move further in the world because 
they have the ability to, you have the ability to leave a child a little long. You have the ability to not have to, there's a certain things that a dad can't do that a mom can do, you know, and the fact that we have formulas and we have all these sorts of things that can make motherhood technologically much easier. It has freed women up to be able to pursue other things. You take all those things away and we're left with women being in a situation where they were 150 years ago, which way they were very much tied to the home and tied to the child. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting because I think it, it's something I hadn't quite thought about before, which is potentially like the removal of like physical labor yeah. from the workplace. We no longer need people doing really dangerous jobs that require a lot of physical strength. Um when we can have machines do all the really hard and dangerous work, then more of the jobs are oriented towards the skills of women, which is one thing that you do kind of see is women are a little bit more conscientious than yes. men. So when it comes to like, you know, your, your, your typical office job, women are really good at that. They're organized. They're good at like, you know, yes. managing a lot of different tasks at once and doing them well. And, um, and so, yeah, we've we've kind of turned all of the jobs that men were good at into jobs that machines do. <laughs> and the other remaining jobs are a lot of them are things that women tend to excel at a little bit. Again, absolutely. On absolutely. average. I mean, like, if, average. You, when you think about this, this the conscientiousness and, and also having, I, I think, a little um, um, more grace and communication. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I grew up in a very blue collar area and at most everybody had blue collar jobs. I grew up in the blue collar area. And one of the things that's kind of well known is like, you, you got your guys in the field, the guys that you're, when, when you have jobs that require blunt force labor, <laughs> you know, and you have jobs that require physical grit. Um, those are the jobs that no one's asking for equality in. No one's asking for a 50% distribution and those jobs are dominated by men and they're harder and there you go. And in a lot of those jobs, kind of the, the kind of the joke is, is you kind of need a woman to manage them. You know, that, that that's you kind of need somebody to kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of rough around the edges and the way that they talk to them. They can get these guys to to they'll do anything that she says, the office manager, you know, and but there, there's there's that on average, a uh, better relational skills, you know, that, that the average woman can 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 bring to this that the males aren't, um, you know. So I think that, that we forget about this a lot of times is, you know, we're not just where we are because um, because we chose for it to be, but because it was able to happen. We were able to advance because advancing was possible, because it was made possible through technology. And yes, and as the ability to to do these things is advancing, then there's a call to do those things, right? And also that greater mo that greater desire to do it um, creates more incentive, right? To create solutions to allow this, right? So it is a a circle of of, of this. You know, I um I just uh, a paper that I co-authored. I was a very low level co-author on this very impressive paper um, that looked at um, gender bias and hiring over the past forty four years, and. It was it broke this down by like stereotypically male and stereotypically female jobs. And what they found was with stereotypically female jobs, there's always been a very small bias in favor of women for those jobs. And it's been virtually unchanged, whereas for stereotypically male jobs, there used to be a small bias, small, very small in comparison to what people think, but a small bias in favor of men. But starting around 2009, that has reversed. And now women are favored for those jobs, too. For the jobs that are considered stereotypically male. Um, but while I was writing this little uh, blog or whatever, popular press, popular press piece for an online magazine called Queer Majority, I was looking up, you know, different statistics about what men and women think is happening. And I came across one from either Gallup or Pew. And apparently uh, millennial women think that men have it easier the most of any generation of women. So like older women who potentially literally were discriminated against uh, in education and in job opportunities are, they see things as more balanced than millennial women who presumably have seen the least gender-based discrimination. And at first I thought, well, this is kind of funny. Like the women who have suffered the least 
uh, seem to think things are the most unfair. But as I was thinking about it, and after I published the piece, <laughs> so maybe I would go back and add a footnote, it occurred to me that it's actually possible that things are now kind of like harder for women because women have made so many strides in education and in the workplace that now they're sort of expected to do two full jobs, which is have a full-time career and be a full-time mom. And so like all of this progress we've made to advance women in the workforce, it's not clear, even if it's fairer to women and women have more opportunities, it's not clear to me that that's actually making things easier on women. It's potentially making things harder <laughs> on women because uh, now there are more people in the workforce. So, uh, you know, there's more competition and more competition on the end of people trying to get jobs, not on the end of employers. Um, and now norms are changing and women are expected to be career women. And then, but turns out if you have a kid, the kid really needs the mom more than they need the dad. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's potentially actually made things harder on women, even if it's even I, if it's fair. I agree hundred percent, and I think that, you know, that it's it's sad because of that because we 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 allow the narrative, even push the narrative that one can have all of everything, and yeah, right. it goes back to Sal's quote: "Is there are no solutions, only trade offs." And you know, I, when I hear people give advice, I saw this recently in an online forum, and a woman said, "You know, well, you know, I." I did my, my kids early. You should wait as long as possible. And then in your thirties or forties or whatever, then you should find a man and get, and get married and have your children. I'm like, honey, you're, you're ignoring some other things, some other trade-offs that I'm not going to say out loud, yeah. but there are other trade-offs. <laughs> and, um, and it's not that I'm, one I, is the risk of health complications sure, when you're sure. getting pregnant in your late 30s the risk of, of, of finding a mate um, is right. you know, that sort yeah. of thing as well. And um, it, I mean, you could why not flip it and have kids when you're 20 and then enter the workforce when you're 33 absolutely. and your kids are. in. Yes. School. And so you know, <laughs> the, the idea that they're like, this is going to sound real novel. It's people might make different decisions and to me the 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 backbone of feminism that that i wholeheartedly agree with was that women should have choices and be able to make their own choices and if you want to prioritize getting married and having a child you know children and getting that then, then, then wonderful but you do need honey to understand the trade when i say honey i'm talking about like i'm talking to my niece or a daughter or something like that is you know honey you need to think about if you do this early, then here's the trade-offs you're making. Also, if you focus on this other thing, then here's the potential trade-offs you're making. And you need to accept there'll be some trade-offs because you can't have all of everything. You can have some of all of it, but you do have to, to, to choose what your priorities are and understand the costs of it. And that's not something we want to talk about, that there's cost to these things. And then, you know, the also the, the trade-offs that, that men that um, are, you know, your top one percenters, if you will, that they're making to get ahead in their life, you know, of I've always had this feeling in, you know, my brother's 14 years older than me. And so I've been an uncle, for, you know, I'm, I'm the fun uncle. I'm like halfway between, I'm like halfway between his age, you know, his kids are about, I'm like halfway between his kids and him. You know, so I'm, I'm almost like an older brother to, to hit to his kids, you know. And so I've seen his life change and his priorities change. So there's always been this thing in the back of my mind is when I get married and have children, I'm going to be a different man because I'm not going to want to work as much. I'm not going to be burning midnight all. I want to spend time with my, my wife. I'm going to want to, you know, um, the next dollar is not worth missing out on getting the coach T-ball and those sorts of things. And, um, you know, there's there's advantages for being a male in that, in that, in, in, in that, in some ways, because as you mentioned, a child just doesn't need a father in those, there's a certain phase that they don't, that they don't need it as much. Right. But still the men are still making trade-offs with, you know, mm -hmm. in order to pursue things at a certain level. And, you know, this is something that, that, that doesn't get discussed when the gender pay gap comes up is men are working more hours, you know, and other, mm -hmm. and other, other things like that. Yeah, there are even ones looking at, for example, 
the study came out like five or six or seven years ago that is even just looking at uber drivers and um male uber drivers make more because you know they're more willing to work the the 2 a.m shift when all the drunk people are out and the surges are up because you know the bars are closing um so you see it there too but i do think there's something else interesting happening which is we talk a lot about the like advantage of the two income family and this is kind of I think, raise standards for people. And now we sort of have the expectation that people are going to earn the two income family amount of money and they're going to be able to live at that lifestyle level, which means, you know, they have to have a house and they have to go on the fancy vacations and they have to have a nice car. And so men whose wives choose not to work, they kind of look like failures because they don't have that extra 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar income coming into their house and taking care of their family. And so I actually think it's both putting more pressure on men and women, whereas women, you know, they feel they have to have a career and they have to get meaning in that way. And then they have their kid and then they feel pulled in different directions because maybe they, you know, they really want to spend more time with their children. Um, and a full time job makes that really hard. And at the same time, men who, you know, they kind of want their wife to work because they want to have that two income household where they, it, you know, it looks like they're more successful because they have more things and they're living a higher quality lifestyle. Um, but then when you have like a, a man whose wife takes time off of work, he might feel, well, I need to earn more money to compete with all the men whose wives are working. Um, and so it creates this pressure that the male, the man feels like a failure and he needs to be making two incomes to be as well off as all of his buddies whose wives work. Um, And so, yeah, I do wonder how much that dynamic is contributing to a lot of the stress and anxiety and all the mental health things that people are panicked about these days is like, we're, we've sort of raised the bar for everyone. And now everyone feels like they're falling short of that new bar. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I had to post this into something else, but now it you know, reminds me of technology. You know, I, I'd seen a post um, you know, t- talking about the, the amount of time children are, are now putting on technology and that allows us mm-hmm. to do less parenting and allows uh, allows children to get by without, without interpersonal. It does seem very convenient to just plop your head, your kid down in front of the television it, it with is. their iPad. It is. I mean, for, you know, the... the, the, the we were hearing this about television rotting your brain when, when you and I were kids and now it's <laughs> iPhones rotting your brain. And the other thing about the TV is it, it you know, we only had one in the house and it was only allowed on so many hours a day. And, you know, it only had three channels. They, they, exactly. <laughs> and, um, you know, now you can have that with you 24 seven and you give kids, um, I saw this, uh, I read a teacher's forum here and there because I'm interested in what people are hearing from, um, in elementary and high schools. And also one of my best friends from undergrad is an elementary teacher in Massachusetts. And so he gives me a lot of information, what he sees in classrooms and what he's seeing. And And it's, you give people free time to, to talk and it's boom, everybody goes on their phone and, you know, on apps and it's like, hold on, no, no, no phones. And there are kids that have just put their head down and not talk. You know, and then just, nope, it's, if I can't be on my phone, it's nothing. I'm just gonna put my head down and, and, and nothing, you know. And it's just because they don't like know how to. That, that's, like, that's, that's what we're, that's, that's what we're seeing. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and it's, and it's been um, made much worse. If you look at the developmental by uh, developmental, um, uh, what is the word, I guess, standards or um, mm-hmm. uh, checkpoints that you'd expect um, COVID um, destroyed right. a lot of this in a lot of ways at every level, because, you know, when you're, when you're under 18 years old, every year is kind of a big developmental year, you know, Uh, especially, (laughs) especially when you're under seven, you know, those under seven Mm -hmm. years, there's so many different things that are happening, but really every year after that is, is, um, is is huge. You know, the, the, the impact on someone who is 27, you know, 27 to 29, not that big a deal, but the impact of someone Mm -hmm. who's five to seven, or 11 to 13, that's huge in in the social interactions and things like that. And, you know, face to face and Mm -hmm. and those sorts of things and, um, and being able to navigate. Figuring out how to like 
overcome the shyness and accept the social anxiety and realize this is normal. Exactly. But you move past it by talking to people and then eventually you get to know them and then you're no longer scared. And, <laughs> and everything is labeled, fun, actually. you know, because it's, yeah. you have anxiety. So, and, and, you know, this, I know this is a controversial topic is, you know, anxiety and depression and all these different things that people deal with that are real things. But, you know, the overwhelming majority of it is the, the state of being human and navigating situations that are difficult. And anytime that you're facing some adversity, you know, that's one of the things that teachers are reporting is more just blowing up and can't do it. And well, they have this, they have that, they have the other. And it's, well, you've not really had to navigate this at the first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, when we're preventing you from ever navigating this, you know, it's kind of like saying, you know, I, I use weightlifting as an analogy is, you know, listen, you're going to need to lift five pounds. I know that, I know that in life, you know, at a certain point when you're a certain, a child at a certain level, five pounds is a lot, you know, and it's like, well, that's hard for you. Yeah, but you're going to need to lift five pounds. You need to go ahead and do it. And then seven pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 25 pounds. I don't know how many pounds the average person needs to be able to lift, but at a certain point, if you're saying, well, that's hard for you to navigate, you shouldn't navigate it. You should stop then you're preventing them from getting just the average level of strength in that area. No, you don't need to become an Olympic weightlifter. You don't need to lift 300 pounds. Only people that really want to should be able to, to, to do that. Um, but you do need to be able to navigate these different stages. And a lot of times we're preventing people from, from developing the skills to navigate basic stages of life and interpersonal relationships and just the friction that is, communicating and living the lot in a world where other people have their own interests. Right. Yeah. Like a, a lot of the controversy is how much should we be pathologizing like normal psychological discomfort, which is like, you know, everyone feels anxious sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean that something's wrong with you and you need to start going to biweekly therapy sessions or go on medication rather, you know, what you do is you're like, yeah, this, this kind of sucks. It's a little awkward, but whatever it'll pass. <laughs> and it does. Um, so yeah, it seems more and more where we're saying that we need to be treating everything rather than acknowledging that some of this is just a normal part of the human experience. And by just powering through and dealing with it, you know, you give people, that's how you give people the tools to deal with those kinds of uncomfortable feelings. Um, not always true, of course, but a lot of the time it is true. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, that's not really my area of expertise, but it is something that I've, I've, I've thought about, especially in regards to like differences between men and women and how we might want to treat those things. Women might think it's more important to label uh, something as something that needs to be fixed and to have some kind of medical or therapeutic intervention to deal with those things. Not a hundred percent sure about that. Um, but it would be kind of consistent with, you know, women's tendency to want to like tend to emotional and psychological harm um, and to try to fix those things. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the perception that things have to be the same to be equally valuable. You know, I'll, I'll give an example of, of my life and my relationship with my mom and my relationship with my dad he remembers when they got electricity added to their house. He grew up with an outhouse. He remembers when he got indoor plumbing. He had never seen a television until he got in the army. You know, he was growing up in very rural Alabama in the forties. And uh, you know, so uh, it's a different world. And, you know, so he was a tough guy and he would tell me from my childhood is Joshua, I'm not raising a child. I'm raising a man. My job is to prepare you for the world that it that, that is not for the world as it should be. And I think that we create so much expectations of a perfect world. And yes, we should work to improve the world. But my dad didn't create expectations for a perfect world. In fact, he said things to me like when I was um, disappointed with some of the things that I was getting or earning, if you will, he, he told me, he's like, son, do not expect to get what you've earned. You're the junk man's son. And if you want 
what mm-hmm. you deserve, you need to do twice as much because you're not just going to be handed what you deserve as the junk man son. Mm-hmm. And that was a, probably a good mentality. Deal with it. It was, hey, you're. I think almost everyone thinks that they don't get what they deserve in life, meaning that almost everyone thinks yes. that they deserve more than they Absolutely. get. And it's like everyone feels that yes. way. So you know, too bad. <laughs> yeah. And it was, and it was, you're, you're an overcomer. You're an overcomer. You're an overcomer. You can do it, work hard. You can do it, do more and, and you'll get it. Trust in the Lord. Faith was a big part of our life. Um, but, and I get it. A lot of people feel that way, but at the same time, it's, do I just make myself a victim of it? Or do I say, Hey, this is, this is the stakes. It takes what it takes. This is what it costs. Whether it, whether the cost is fair or not, are you willing to pay it? And so my, that was my dad's attitude of looking at it. my mom was, I go out in the field and work hard and do all these things. And then mom is licking my wounds and she's encouraging me and she's, you know, kind of the doting on me and she's much more of a feminine touch and, you know, the, just the, the words of encouragement and the love and the softness. And, you know, if it wasn't for my mother, I would be a much harder man. And that I was able to develop the, the softness of the inside and think about the relationships. And there was a point in my life where, you know, my brother's 14 years old, he's playing college football when I was four, you know, and I'm left at home with two sisters and a mom. And so I'm developing this other side and the feminine and the caring and the talking and the communicating. And I'm known in my family as being the man that communicates the best out of, out of, out of, out of our, you know, little, little core of men, you know, but I also had the most time with women, you know, in, in my formative years. And it's like, which one was, was, was more valuable to me was my mother's influence and my sister's influence or my father and brother's influence. And I, I look at it and say, I would be much worse of a person if I had, twice as much of my dad and brothers ahead of my, my mom and sister. I also look at it and say, if I had twice as much as of them and half as much as my, my dad and brother, I'd be worse of a person then, you know, is right, which yeah. was more important to me. I'm like, I, I can't pick, I can't pick. You can't ask me to pick yeah. which was most important because they added different things in my life. They were equal in value, but they were different in function. Hmm. Yeah. So it's like, someone who, you know, boosts you up. So you have the confidence to keep going, but then someone also to kind of keep you a realist and, you know, you know, make sure that you, you don't become kind of, I guess, like selfish or greedy or like think you deserve more than you're special or than you really are more special than you really yeah, are. You, you get a little bit um, of a kick in the ass. Um, and, and, yeah. And, you know, a little bit of a push and it's kind of like the you know, baby bird flying push out of the nest. You know, you're, doesn't matter what I think at 18, the world's going to decide you're a man. Yeah. And you're either. There's a, there was a paper that I just saw like two days ago, maybe three days ago, um, where it was looking at people's um, salaries and it was looking at how much people think they need to be happy. And it was, everyone felt like they needed like 30 to 50% more. So if you make 35 K a year, you thought you'd be happy if you could make 50k a year. If you made 50k a year, you thought you had to make 75k a year. If you made 100k, you needed 150. If you had 200, you needed 300. Um, and I think it's just this, this like, it's part of you know the human experience is like nobody's ever satisfied with what they have, and everyone thinks that they deserve more and that you know they're capable of earning more, and that keeps people motivated. But at the same time, it can make people really unhappy because they're living in a constant state of deprivation, even though in reality, almost none of us are truly deprived, at least not in the United States these days. You know, we all live very, very comfortable. (laughs) Not all of us. Most of us live very comfortable lives, especially compared to, yeah, 100 years ago when, you know, even things like I lived in England for a couple of years and (laughs) I, I was like so entitled from living in the U.S. Like, for example, if I want to take a shower, I had to turn the heater on, the water heater on, like an hour before I was going to take a shower. And I thought, oh, I got to wake up an hour early to turn the heater on so I can take my hot shower. <laughs> and it seemed like, you know, I, I'd been spoiled by it. just turn on the hot shower and take a hot shower for so long. But then, you know, there was a point in time or there are places in the world today where there's no such thing as a hot shower. 
sometimes there's no such thing as a shower. Um, so yeah, we, we, we can get spoiled, um, by this, this just constant state of dissatisfaction, which, which keeps people striving, but it also keeps them dissatisfied and feeling like they deserve more than they, they probably do. Yeah. And, and then there's also the, the, the idea of, you know, how does one improve oneself and how that is, pers how that is, um, I guess, operationalized or conceptualized, uh, by different folks. You know, and you know, I think you've talked about this before is how men, um, I, I saw a video of, of that I thought was pretty funny and it was obviously designed to, to poke fun of it and, and give it from the, you know, the, the, the most extreme angle. And it's, it compared, um, male self-improvement videos, like the shorts that you see mm -hmm. on, on YouTube, and then the shorts you see from women on for like working on your calves or something. Oh, it was it was like for men it was something like, you know, you're a piece of crap and you need to you you know you you need to get get off your ass and do something and you're you know you're you're you know just like beating you down and you know like what I remember you know from like training for football is like you know you're gonna don't be weak you're gonna get your ass kicked and you you know just kind of the pushing you and more like a military you get the Jocko uh, you know, Jocko Willick and you get, what's his name? The, uh, the, the, the guy that, um, does all the ultra marathons and stuff. You get this, you're, you know, you're, you are low and you need to push it and raise yourself up by the bootstraps and stop being such a loser. And that's the kind of thing that it's, that, that does the female videos and come kind of combination. It's like, you're enough. You need to love yourself you're good enough and you're strong enough and doggone it. People like you doing the, you know, the, the, the Stuart Smiley sort of thing. And um, just how, how we kind of conceptualize self-improvement and how does that kind of filter into how we approach truth in academia and, and the goal of science in in academia and how these things kind of filter down into, into culture. I was curious here. You know, there, there might actually be a little bit of uh, that those different approaches might actually make sense. So a fairly consistent gender difference, I think, is that women tend to be a little bit underconfident and men tend to be a little bit overconfident. Men think they're better than they are and women think they're not as good as they are. And so it might be really optimal actually to build women up a bit and to tear men down a little bit to make them give women the confidence they need to pursue the things they're capable of and you know get men to work a little harder to achieve the thing that they think they already deserve um i do have like a little bit of sometimes i worry about those videos where they're like um you know they'll say something and i think these tend to be geared toward women they'll say something like um like you know, life is short, you focus on you and do what's best for you and don't worry about other people and people aren't worth your time and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't know if that's the kind, be purely selfish and just only think about yourself and spend all of your time treating yourself. And like, I, I, I don't know that that's necessarily healthy. So it can go a bit too far, I think. Um, but there potentially is some sense too. And I, I think, I think people are actually pretty good at kind of understanding where other people are. So when you look at like mentoring students, you know, some men are going to be pretty sensitive and insecure and maybe need a confidence boost. And some women are going to be like egomaniacs and maybe they need to be taken down a notch. Um, and I think people are pretty good at um, detecting that in other people and, and then, you know, treating them accordingly. It's, it's harder when you're making a mass video that's going to go out on TikTok. Um, I think these, I think these things are, are are different when it comes to the context. Um, you know, and one of the things you, for example, when you think of it, it's been shown that men, um, in perceiving of of sexual or romantic interest, men perceive women's interest in them as being higher than it actually is, and women perceive a man's interest as being lower than it actually is. And that's funny, but at the same time, you know, the argument is that that's probably, from an evolutionary standpoint, adaptive because the cost of a potential mate is higher for a man. Is so if, if the cost of her saying no is I'm not interested is very very low versus if she'd have said yes and this is potentially your wife and the you know the 
uh, the mother of your children, then the cost of, of not trying is very low. Obviously, that's changed in a world where um, in some online forums, there's the shaming of men for even trying, you know, so that's a, that's a different extreme. That's something that is a new thing that we're dealing with as a society. Um, but that it's that cost of missed opportunities is higher for men. At the same time, if you look at, if you look at this from a dating perspective of in, in, in so many things, women tend to have a lot less confidence or, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I say a lot, but have um, significantly, scientifically significantly less confidence than men in certain things. So yeah, I can see that as men need a little bit of a kick and women need a little bit of a boost. I can, I can see that. It's It does not appear to be so on the data regarding um, uh, mate selection. And if you look at asking women to rate men, men will rate over 80 to 90% of, of the, you know, the study of men as being below average in looks, where if you look at the, the, the graph is extremely skewed to the left, right? Whereas a graph of men rating women based on just on, on, on interest is a, a, almost a normal distribution is overwhelmingly fives, you know, then going down in, in each direction. And then if you ask them to rate themselves, um, men are much likely or much more accurate in, in, in rating themselves as most men rate themselves fives. And then you kind of see this typical bell curve where if you're asking a woman to rate herself or her friends, they tend to be highly skewed with the peak being more at the, at the eight and then going down from there. So you'll tend to see that the average woman, and a lot of this is coming from, from dating app data. So that is a whole different conversation itself is what is it about dating apps that maybe caused this to happen mm -hmm. in the context of dating apps, there being so much more men on dating apps, things like that. But mm -hmm. then the, then there's the question of, is there a feedback loop that affects how things are in life? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because it's, I think it, with the data, so there are a couple of things I'm thinking. One is there's this effect called the above average, a better than average effect that seems to be both men and women are vulnerable to where they tend to think they're better than average at everything good yes. and below average at everything bad. Everyone's better so that, than average. that is true. <laughs> everyone's smarter than average. Everyone's better looking than average. Everyone's nicer. Everyone's funnier. Um, all those kinds of things. But if, if what you're, I, I'm not familiar with the data you're talking about, but I wonder if, if one thing that potentially is happening there is what you get with the dating apps is it seems to be that the average woman on a dating app gets a ton of male attention, but the average male doesn't get all yeah. that much female attention um, because it's a very, that's like a very short term mating. I mean, granted, some people meet their soulmate on there and get married. It's um, the number one, but a lot of number one is, way people are meeting now it is the number one way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that does happen, but I, I suspect the, the average interaction on there, the intention is, to have sex uh and women when it comes to just having sex with people they're more selective than men are and so women might feel more desirable on there because it's that short-term meeting context and so they're getting a lot of male attention if it was an app that was like this app is only for people who are trying to get married um then you might actually expect that women would be giving more attention to men and that the men would be the ones who are hyper confident because all these women want to marry like you know the desirable men i suppose the ones with the good jobs and you know the doctors etc um so uh yeah it, it it could be that those dating apps cause sort of skewed perceptions of one's mate value because they're this like short-term uh mating uh dating approach yeah uh, um, part of that is because of when you when you say well what is the goal of the app well it it's it doesn't matter what the user said or what the app says it's kind of what the user is there for right um mm -hmm. and the willingness to engage in short-term mating strategy even if the goal is, is is long and what you see from women is if the goal is short, the goal is short. But what you see from men is they can actually have the goal of long, but still be willing to engage in short. And so when if, if men are willing to engage in short term 
relationship, when I'm, I'm using this as a blanket term, obviously, of lots of different things, um, then their standard will be much lower than if they're only mm -hmm. looking for exclusively long term. Whereas exactly. women tend to be much more likely to be one of if it's long term, they're not interested in short term. Right. And they're interested in short term as a means to the long term, means which the means -term. they only want to gauge in a short term relationship with a man if they think it might turn into yes. a long term one, which means her standards for short term mating are about the same as for long term, yes. whereas for men. There's yes. a big gap. <laughs> so what this so this, yeah. this has been hypothesized. I don't know if this is there's any proof that this has hypothesized that this that this is what's causing it is you'll have the man who is in let's say that the tenth decile um, of of female interest and for short term strategy he's willing to go down to some bottom ten you mean maybe not the, top, uh, top ten sorry the the the, top the, 10, the, yeah. the tenth decile right uh, the top top ten percent mm -hmm. or especially top five percent. Um, that he's willing to go down to, you know, the sixth decile, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, and so because he's interacting with and having dates with women at the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth deciles, that those women get the perception that this is the man that I can get. Whereas mm -hmm. for a long-term relationship. So right. they're waiting for that guy where for he's willing to go down to that level for the short-term relationship, but not necessarily for the long-term relationship. He's looking for someone that's, much more at, at his level right whereas yeah i think they there, there have been a studies looking at that way with the, with these dating apps what you do seem to see is like the majority of women are competing for the top 10 yes. percent of men yeah. so the top 10 percent of men on the dating apps do really well yeah. but the bottom 90 percent don't yeah. um whereas the top you know 60 percent of women on dating apps do well yeah. because men some of them are looking for the short-term thing um Whereas the women are really just looking for the long term thing. And so you get this kind of conflict of of goals. Uh, so, yeah, probably the 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 women who are whatever, like they're in the top 60 percent and then they get a short term opportunity with the top 10 percent. And then they get their heart broken because he wasn't interested in a long term thing. He really was just, yeah. you know, lowering the bar so that he could get laid, as it were. <laughs> Yeah, I, I prefer to say engaging in short-term strategies. <laughs> 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 keep it, keep it, keep it right at G. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. no I, 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 if you're, if, Have a, an adult experience. <laughs> we're, we're going there. We're going there. We're going there. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's funny. So um, I, I had not expected us to get into the discussion of, of, of dating app. Uh, I didn't either. <laughs> I I also just say it's not like I I'm aware of some of that research, but it's not my area of research, and I've never been on a dating app. I feel like I missed out on uh, a a core part of the millennial experience. But I, I hear it's good that I haven't had to deal with that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I I could, I could agree. Thank you for tuning in today to Untamed Ethos and our guest, Dr. Corey Clark. For the second half of this conversation, we'll be coming out with the next episode, episode 21 next week. So be sure to tune in next week for episode 21 with Dr. Clark. Uh, we'll be getting into some other ways that uh, academia is suppressing and um, certain viewpoints, looking for censoring certain ideas, hiring biases, um, also differences scientifically between men and women and how those different priorities uh, are influencing both academia and the workplace. And um, are there uh, ways in which political agendas are infiltrating academia that maybe we're not seeing or not being so much covered by mainstream media? Look forward to seeing you then.